This video is about what many would argue is the worst possible. Losing a child is a tragedy, no matter who you are, where you live, or when in history or the future you live. Most sensitive topics regarding health and death becomes intuitively less sensitive when zooming out, when looking at a whole nation or the world instead of a single family. That is often a strategy I take when covering these types of topics. And it works too for such a heavy topic as child mortality, but maybe less so than when talking about causes of death for older age groups. Today, the norm is that children live. It is hard to, even on a societal level, talk about a subject like this with a plain academic viewpoint and not evoke feelings, both as a creator and as a consumer. But I will try anyway, even though I have, in some instances, in the research for this, avoided numbers that are too small. Numbers for areas or time periods that become so small as to almost become personal. If you're in the age of possibly having children, or if you recently have, ask yourself, are you afraid of the worst possible happening? Of your children or potential children dying? Odds are you will say yes, at least for those of you who already have children. That fear will probably always be a part of being a parent. And it is hard to argue that is not an evolutionary, mostly advantageous trait. It will most likely have the result that you ensure your children is out of harm's way, protected from any threat they themselves aren't developed enough to assess. But if I ask the question instead like, do you think it's a significant risk that your child will die from a disease or accident? Then more people will probably say no, based on how dangerous they see the world. And if we phrase the question to say if they believe children in general are likely to die from those threats, in high income nations, close to no parents would say yes. We know enough to say that most children survive to adulthood, and to some extent, that can also influence the assessed risk for our own children, even if that evolutionary bias is still there. Of course, if we change perspective to another part of the world, say a low-income nation, with a still higher child mortality, the answers would change, though maybe not as much as you think. If we asked at different times throughout history though, we would get drastically different answers. Today very few parents have to calculate how many children they have, based on the very real risk that some of them will not survive. I have talked more about this in my video on fertility rates, which you can watch by following the link in the description. But of course there can be new threats looming on the horizon. Take COVID-19 for example. Few people in high income nations are afraid of communicable diseases as a big killer. This is one explanation for anti-vaccination movements gaining traction. In a world where you don't see communicable diseases as a threat anymore, it is easy to see the vaccine as of higher risk than the disease it is manufactured to prevent. But with COVID-19, there was a communicable disease that we could see posed a great threat to us, including our children. And as we know today, a few years after the initial outbreak, many children did die in COVID-19 in 2020 and 2021. As of October 2022, 1300 children had died as a result of COVID-19 in the United States alone. A number clearly indicating the importance of, for example, enforcing schooling from home. Right? But here we must have more than one thought in mind at the same time. We know that our children are safer than ever especially from the threat of disease. But we fail to properly assess the more common causes of death among children. They are all rare, for sure, 
but more children died of lower respiratory infections per year before the pandemic than of COVID during the pandemic. In fact, that is true for a multitude of causes that we would never enforce closing schools for. But this is part of our very human, though faulty, risk assessment. We overestimate the risk of the things we cannot control, like being the victim of murder or a communicable disease. But we underestimate the risk of the things we can control, like being in a car accident or accidentally harming ourselves or someone we love with a weapon, or the risk of actively taking a vaccine. We also overestimate the risk of very unlikely events that get much attention when they do occur to someone, be it sharks or terrorist attacks, and underestimate the risk of heart disease or cancer, a very likely way to die. But let's go back and look at the numbers regarding child mortality more in depth. The drop in child mortality is the main factor in the rise in human average lifespan in the last century. We will never know the exact historical number, but from the best sources we have and from what we can extrapolate from the slow growth rate of the human race up until the 19th century, most likely every other child died before adulthood. 500 in every 1,000 children born. Now let's compare that number to nations today. Let's start with Somalia, ranking among the lowest in the world in all types of human development measures. Somalia is one of the poorest nations on earth and highly affected by unrest and natural disasters like severe droughts. The child mortality in Somalia in 2021 was 114 in 1000 births. And Somalia had the highest child mortality in the world in 2021. We have some other poor African nations here, like Sierra Leone at 96, Nigeria at 75, Angola at 70. All of them way, way below the historical level of the world. And now we need to zoom in. Let's start to scale from 100 instead. Leaving the African continent, Afghanistan had a child mortality of 56 in every 1,000 births, one tenth of the historical rate of the world. Yemen had 54, Myanmar 42, and India 32. Then we have some of the more economically successful African nations, like Egypt at 19, Tunisia at 15, and Libya at 10. Let's once again zoom in and start to scale at 20. We find Mexico and Iran at 12, Argentina and Turkey at 9, and the United States at 6. Serbia is at 5 for every 1,000 births, 99% lower than the historical rate, but we can go even lower. Germany is at 3, South Korea at 2.8, and Norway at 2.2. And for 2021, Finland had the lowest number in the world with 1.52, meaning that 99.998% of all children survived. Here's another way to look at it, with all the nations of the world in four categories. In 1920, most of the world had a child mortality of more than 250 in every 1,000 births. But the last 100 years has been absolutely remarkable. And as we can see, even though the poorer nations are lagging behind, we see huge improvements in all nations. The adaption to modern medicine and healthcare, the implementation of vaccination programs, and the improved access to births assisted by medically trained personnel has pushed nation of the nation to the left in this visualization. And finishing in 2020, we can see that no nation is still in the 250 plus category. Only four are in the 100 to 250 category. And an additional 30 odd nations in the category above 50 deaths for every 1000 births. And it is worth mentioning here that these four nations worst off today are all very close to joining the 50 to 100 category. For you watching this, based on my YouTube demographics, you are most likely living in a nation with a very low child mortality. So low that you will not have to take it into consideration when making life choices. But it is the relationship between these two factors that make this development so important. Apart, of course, from the reduction in human suffering it has resulted in. When living under conditions where the risk of losing a child is high, parents often also live 
under the economic circumstances that they are dependent on their children as workforce, for example, in their family agriculture. To a lesser extent, parents can also be dependent on their children for economic support later in life, but this is less supported in research. And this is the main reason family chooses to have many children. And if a society has moved on from the most basic level of the demographic transition, which all nations of the world have, this will lead to four, five, six of the children surviving and bringing about a very fast population growth. A lowered child mortality can be the fastest way to ensure a falling fertility rate. And that in turn has many great advantages to a family that must feed fewer children and to a nation. There are also other factors at play here, like the access to contraceptives, the educational level of the parents, as well as the woman's participation in the workforce, among other factors measuring the level of gender equality. These factors can bring about some geographical differences, but overall the relation between a falling child mortality and falling fertility rates is true everywhere. Even though child mortality levels are down, this graph shows the global deaths per age group every year. As we can see, the youngest group stand out. Children are vulnerable during their first months to years of life. Let us look at the causes of death that are still today prevalent in children. Today around 140 million babies are born every year into the world. Slightly over 5 million of them will not survive their fifth birthday, around 3.5%. Here we visualize them with one marker for every 10,000 deaths. The so-called neonatal disorders, including asphyxia and trauma at birth, and children being born prematurely, stood for 1 in 3 deaths. Congenital birth defects also killed another 10%. Diarrheal diseases stand at 10% and pneumonia at 15%. Accidents and injuries account for 4%, nutritional disorders 3%, malaria 7%, and the other classic infectious diseases like tetanus, meningitis, measles and more stand for close to 8%. All of these have gone down significantly since 1990. But we can dig further into that statistic by looking at in what age group we are seeing the largest improvements. The most significant drop in mortality since 1990 has occurred between the age of 1 and 5 years, and also between 1 month and 1 year. The progress has been slower when it comes to causes killing children in their first days to weeks of life. The reason behind this is partially that two of the leading causes of death among children between 1 and 5 years are easily treatable. Pneumonia and diarrheal diseases, for instance, is very closely associated with poverty and can and has been pushed back with improvements in air and water quality, health services and nutrition. So-called child wasting, children receiving too few calories per day, is the main cause of vulnerability towards these conditions. Today, access to vaccination for rotavirus can also reduce the risk of dying from diarrheal diseases significantly. Malaria follows similar patterns and can be reduced by access to insecticide-treated bed nets and HIV-AIDS by access to medication for the mother so as to reduce the risk of transmitting to her baby, as well as access to medication for a child already carrying the virus. The development has been, although still good, slower when it comes to the causes of death in the first few months of life, mainly neonatal disorders. This is our markers on a world map. One marker for every 10,000 children dying per year. As we can see, the low-income nations are overrepresented. Large, populous nations like Nigeria, India, Pakistan and Congo still have big problems with child mortality. The markers placed in the middle of the Indian Ocean represent all nations with levels too low for a single marker. These 22 nations have lowered their child mortality levels with more than 80% in the last 30 years. And in terms of the largest drops, we find a bunch of African nations at the top, with Liberia, 
that has gone from 26% down to 7.8%, Malawi from 24% to 3.8%, and Niger that has gone from 33% down to 7.7%. Risk assessment is a fascinating concept. Sometimes it feels like the evolutionary beneficial traits that have survived for millennia aren't working as well for us today. Be it the media landscape that has changed and the amount of information we receive daily, or the changes in how our healthcare functions. Threats, of course, still exist, even in high-income nations. After all, everyone dies from something. But our faulty risk assessments often make us focus on highly unlikely events, rather than the mundane ones. And sometimes it fails even more spectacularly when we are focusing on someone we love, rather than ourselves. In high-income nations, we can sometimes be good at seeing our own privilege. Our privilege of being born in a rich nation with a high life expectancy. Quite often so much so, that we think that people in middle-income and low-income nations are way worse off than they actually are. Maybe it would be good for us to more often say how lucky we are to be born in a great time, rather than in a great place. I find that our worldview is often a lot grimmer than it should be. It happens for me too. For me, looking at the numbers and reminding myself of the development we have already seen in the world often helps. To see that we have made great progress, not only since the 19th century, but also during my lifetime. But I also have great respect that for others, numbers aren't as effective as for me. I think it is important to have respect for people's fears and perceived threats, no matter if you yourself find them likely or even possible. Child mortality is for sure a dark topic, and it is a hard bargain to say how well we have done when still 5 million children are dying in the world every year. But at the same time, if we don't see our progress in the darkest of subjects, how will we find the energy and push needed to take those final few steps? This was partly a remake of a video I did back in 2020, but with more content and better audio. If you want to see more on my channel on these types of subjects, I recommend my videos on fertility rates and the demographic transition. You can become a member to support my work. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you.